Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar with the Institute for International and European Affairs. Uh, my name is Dario Kallig, and I'm the chair of the UK group uh, in the Institute. And it really is a great pleasure for me to welcome Tommy Gorman. Uh, Tommy, as you know, has been the RTE man in Belfast for 20 years, uh, where he played a central and essential role in explaining in a very profound and complete way uh, to people listening to him uh, what was happening in Northern Ireland. Uh, before that, of course, uh, he was in Brussels, where he played an equally important role uh, just before the, uh, the end of the 20th century in explaining to people in Ireland what was happening uh, in Europe. So it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Tommy. Uh, he will speak to us on the future for Northern Ireland and the relations uh, on these islands. Tommy, you're most welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dahi. Uh, and uh, it's lovely to be talking to people at this uh, really important time in our history. Uh, I retired from RTE earlier this year. I had 41 wonderful years there. Uh, but you don't uh, retire your temptation to watch things, to analyse uh, and to try and see where things are going. Uh, so I'm glad that in recent days I started working with colleagues in uh, a publication or in a website called The Currency and I intend to be providing two long reads there once a month for a start. Uh, so on a day like this when we live in such uncertain times it's it's I suppose it's, it's a very human reaction to look somewhere for ballast and to look for inspiration. So I think back to the day in 19, in two, sorry, in 2008, May 2008, when Tony Blair gambled correctly on like Iraq uh, on the Northern Ireland peace process, when Bertie Ahern was also uh, about to have his role in possibly what was the greatest achievement of his political career. That's uh, the, 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 the contribution they made to the restoration of devolved government in Stormont. Uh, and I suppose it was extremely novel because it brought together the two opposites, Sinn Féin and the DUP at the head of that government. And on that day, Ian Paisley walked down those marble steps in the Stormont chamber and he quoted Ecclesiastes 3. He said, there's a time for everything a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. And as I see it, we are now in the era, one that can't be avoided, of a number of reckonings. And we'll discuss the reckonings that uh, I'm referring to in detail uh, later in this conversation. But first of all, I think it's important to take into account about Ian Paisley, that he, even though he was the all-powerful leader uh, of the DUP, uh, helped in a great way by the chief strategist of the DUP, Peter Robinson, Ian Paisley had to look over his shoulder within his own party too. I think back to a time in November 2006, um, they had come back from St Andrews where there had been a political breakthrough and Ian Paisley gathered his troops in Stormont uh, early in, it was November, late in November, November the 24th, 2006. And on that day, Ian Paisley was attempting to deal with, um, um, I suppose, an upsurge of um, opposition within his own party. They were called the Twelve Apostles, and they were very, very wary about the direction he was about to take, about the signal that he was about to give, that he was pre prepared to go into government. And miraculously, on that day from left field, Michael Stone, a loyalist paramilitary, uh, out, on prison, on, out from prison on licence, attempted to get into Stormont. There was a huge security rumpus, the building had to be evacuated and that managed to buy time for Ian Paisley. Um, the devolution day I re re referred to earlier was in 2007, not in 2008, excuse me. So then the following year, 2007, Paisley led the DUP into power sharing, May 2007. 
Within a year, he was gone. Uh, moved to one side. Moved to one side because he was in his 80s and the difficulties of uh, being at the dispatch box uh, once a week, uh, dealing with questions on, his floor, on the floor of the house in Stormont. Also, some of the reluctance within his own party that he was pursuing this Chuckle Brothers relationship. Chuckle Brothers, a phrase coined by Jerry Moriarty of the Irish Times. This Chuckle Brother relationship with Martin McGuinness that was causing some dissension in his ranks too. So Peter Robinson took over as leader of the DUP. That was 2008, just a year. Ian Paisley had, he had a year uh, as leader and first minister. Then Robinson took over. And Robinson in turn, even though he was a very, very able strategist, he too had his difficulties. You'll remember when he went to Florida on holidays, was it in August 2013? And he, he dispatched that letter from Florida, which really irked the Martin McGuinness and Sinn Féin because he was withdrawing from some of the commitments that he had made, uh, including plans for developments in what was the site of the old Mays prison. That was called a letter from Florida. Robinson <coughs> continued in power sharing uh, the relationship, and remember, it's a unique relationship, um, this um, mandatory coalition model. Uh, it was far from perfect as it was attempting to find its feet. We always have to remind ourselves that it's a unique relationship in Western Europe, this mandatory coalition model. So Robinson in 2015 was still in power. And one day he was due to go down to address a meeting in Dublin of all places. Uh, and he had health issues. Um, an ambulance was sent for. Uh, and he was subsequently told that had he continued with his travels, he might well have been dead by the time he reached Newry. Peter Robinson required stents. Uh, it forced, I suppose, or it encouraged a revaluation re of his life. And at the end of that year, Peter Robinson stepped aside. That was the end of 2015, and he came into 2016. So now there's a new leader, and this is Arlene Foster. Arlene Foster, who has moved uh, earlier in her career from the Ulster Unionists with Geoffrey Donaldson to the DUP, one of the hammer blows against David Trimble and the Ulster Unionist Party, one of the factors in the growth of the DUP. So Arlene Foster is in, but she too had to look over her shoulder. I remember she was at the Euros with Martin McGuinness uh, in France in 2016. McGuinness was pushing her to go to an Ireland match and a Northern Ireland match as a symbol of a united uh, power sharing administration. Arlene Foster was reluctant to do so. Remember too, in her first year, um, August, in that summer of 2016, the Brexit referendum took place. Brexit referendum that had Arlene Foster and Martin McGuinness scurrying around to see what sort of a, a response they could have that would try to keep their show on the road despite this decision about Brexit. And they spent over a week drafting a two-page letter. It included in it a clause. We need to retain as far as possible the ease with which we trade with EU member states. That was a Northern Ireland response. That was the summer of 2016. And then if you look at what happened towards the end of 2016, George Bush became president of the United States. Martin McGuinness was diagnosed with cancer. And towards the end of 2016, Arlene Foster was now a year in as first minister. The difficulties about the renewable heat incentive controversy began to emerge in a very dramatic way. So before the year was out, Martin McGuinness's health had worsened. Arlene Foster was under such pressure that Sinn Féin was, pre was preparing to withdraw from government and power sharing collapsed. So that was the start of 2016. There was no power sharing administration. You look at what happened since. You had the efforts by the British and Irish governments to get devolved a government up and running again. Jerry Adams, before he left uh, as Sinn Féin leader, before he retired from that position, he made one final effort to, to broker a solution with the DUP uh, to refloat power sharing. That didn't work. And it took the efforts of Simon Coveney and Julian Smith on behalf of the British and Irish governments and the pressure, I think, from the electorate to get power sharing up and running after three years down. So now you have Arlene Foster weakened by her experience of the RHI. You have Brexit 
up and running, plans for it. And then the next thing that comes along, just weeks after that administration was in place, you have the pandemic. Northern Ireland, new administration trying to find its feet, saddled with this pandemic, which I suppose no administration in the civilized world has found a fully effective, fully efficient way of dealing with the pandemic. Northern Ireland was no stranger to it. I suppose its uh, greatest bounce in relation to the pandemic uh, came when the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who was under pressure, gambled in relation to a vaccines policy that was ahead of most other places, the United States and certainly the European Union included, and Northern Ireland got a bounce from that. But the entire 12 months of that new administration in Northern Ireland was spent dealing with the pandemic. There was no opportunity to develop the kind of synergies and the kind of progress and the kind of relationships on other policy areas that would give out a signal of a fully effective government. You look at some of the problems they had. North-South relations were damaged over who's going where, where is the uh, pandemic, uh, uh, the, greater, the greater threat and so on. You look at, say, the policy they had of giving grants to golf clubs, of giving grants to businesses. Uh, there was a Sinn Féin office that caught up, uh, got caught up uh, in, say, that imperfect, pro that imperfect policy that came from the Stormont executive. So you've had the Stormont executive wobbling on so many fronts uh, over the years, uh, exacerbated by Brexit, uh, uh, certainly not helped by the pandemic. And I think it was those circumstances, including the fact that the DUP was this party that always had difficulties adapting to power sharing through Paisley's time, through Robinson's time, and now through Arlene Foster's time, that all those factors were bubbling below the surface. So I think that's what has happened in recent times. And that's why I say we're into a season of reckonings. Uh, we've talked about the DUP, and we can say that that was inevitable. Uh, let's talk about Brexit, because it is the background problem to all of the political instability that we're seeing now. Let's talk about how it happened in Northern Ireland. I remember David Cameron throwing it out there to appease his own critics within his own party. Uh, he made that promise in, in relation, in the run-up to the 2015 election. The Brexit referendum was held then in 2016. Theresa May was one of the few British government ministers uh, who came to North, she was Home Secretary at the time, I think. She came to Northern Ireland immediately before the Brexit vote. There was no sense within Conservative Party politics, and indeed in the debate that was taking place across the water, there was no sense that Northern Ireland was going to be the most vulnerable part of the United Kingdom uh, because uh, if, if Brexit was actually carried, if the decision was taken to withdraw uh, from uh, the European Union. There was absolutely no understanding uh, throughout the Brexit debate of the role that Europe had played in Northern Ireland's peace process. In recent times, we've quite rightly heard the role the Americans had and buy-in from the Americans in the United States. But I think any fair analysis of what happened in terms of the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process would see the impact being a member of the European Parliament had on John Hume, because I walked with him many of those nights in Strasbourg when, you know, he'd go and he'd look and he'd see neighbouring Germany and he'd talk about how Europe was this great example of compromise and reconciliation. And Hume was inspired by what he saw in Europe. And he, in many respects, he encouraged the two administrations and indeed the Americans to Europea Europeanize Ireland's problem, the Northern Irish situation. Uh, and it was ingenious in that respect because it actually built on the fact that we were all part of something bigger. And that something bigger had been quite a positive force in the reconciliation that took place in British and Irish relations in the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, and in more recent times. Dahi, who's chairing the session today, was a diplomat in the Department of Foreign Affairs. He saw 
uh, at first hand what happened when Irish and British diplomats went and sat around that European table when we realized how much we had in common. It was a positive factor in, say, the relationship with Margaret Thatcher and with successive British prime ministers uh, throughout that line that continued right up to the present time of Boris Johnson. It, say, it had an impact on John Major's time. It had a, a huge impact on Tony Blair's time. So there was, in many respects, there was a Europeanization of the Irish situation in the Brexit agreement. And Hume, who was, I always say, provided so much of the ideology for the Good Friday Agreement, recognized that. And when Brexit took place, that very important supportive part of the architecture of the Good Friday Agreement was removed. So as I see it now, when people talk about the Northern Ireland Protocol challenging and in some respects contradicting the Good Friday Agreement, I say that's a very, very valid point. But it also has to go back to where the actual Brexit process began. And it has to question whether that European dimension was taken into account in the Brexit debate in the United Kingdom. And my conclusion is, uh, and I think the evidence is there to support it, that the proper weight, the proper understanding was not given to it. I think it's also worth noting, and, and these sessions, I think, in these times, we should always try to be honest with ourselves and with others. The DUP was the party uh, in Northern Ireland that gave most support to Brexit. There were elements in the Ulster Unionist Party that were quietly supportive of it. There were certainly elements in the, uh, in the Ulster Unionist Party uh, that were against Brexit, that wanted to remain in the, in, say, within the, that wanted Northern Ireland to remain in the EU. But certainly the DUP was the most committed uh, party in favour of Brexit. It actually helped that they had a number of members uh, in the Westminster Parliament, 10 at one stage, down to eight in more recent times. But they were actually playing a role uh, in the Brexit discussions. Their natural allies over the years were the Brexiteers, just as the Brexiteers' nat natural ally in the Brussels press corps I belonged to in the 90s was Boris Johnson. So the DUP were an important contributor to the Brexit debate at Westminster. I think it's also worth pointing out that in the final days of the Brexit process, when the Brexit campaign required further resources, that they used a vehicle of money being given to the DUP and the DUP's finances uh, as a party that was based in Northern Ireland, the DUP were able to return those finances uh, to providing the funding for some of the imported material that was distributed in to large numbers of people in the days and in a very effective way immediately before the Brexit debate took place. So I think it's always very important in discussions like this for us to acknowledge that the DUP was consistently a pro-Brexit party, the only one in Northern Ireland to do so. Uh, and I think it's, it's also relevant to state that Arlene Foster has made a number of very eloquent speeches in recent times, uh, including one in the Storm of the Chamber uh, two days ago. But she did state in the course uh, of uh, her contribution in Stormont on Monday uh, that she continues to support Brexit. So Arlene Foster has shown no say, uh, sign of saying, well, maybe we didn't give full consideration to the deeper consequences and the profound consequences of Brexit. She she's, re remains loyal to her party position that Brexit was the right thing. Did the DUP? Uh, expect that the vote would be carried in favour of the leaving the European Union. I certainly know many senior significant figures in the DUP who did not who did not think that would take place. We all know David Cameron believed it would not take place. And I think it should also be acknowledged that Theresa May, as the British Prime Minister, who showed a lack of awareness of the possible implications of Brexit when she came and she did that interview with Mark Davenport, in I think it was probably May 2016 in Northern Ireland, that as Prime Minister, I think Theresa May began to grasp the more potentially profound consequences of Brexit uh, on Northern Ireland uh, when she became Prime Minister. Um, and I think some of her advisors at, time, at that time were helpful in getting her to that position.
Theresa May was a person who wanted a softer Brexit that would have prevented a lot of the practical issues we are now seeing uh, uh, that flow from the Northern Ireland Protocol. And that has to be said to be fair to her. Um, but the DUP uh, was one of the parties that went along with Boris Johnson uh, in pushing for the harder Brexit. Also think uh, that when we're looking back at Boris Johnson's behaviour, and I see now the suggestion that, oh, they had no idea that, you know, that the Northern Ireland Protocol was going to be affecting people in such a meaningful way. Boris Johnson, in the last few weeks before he had to make his big move in relation to reaching a Brexit compromise with the British government, he and his officials had several important conversations with Irish ministers, with the Taoiseach at the time, and with Irish officials. You know, I'm thinking of the likes of, say, from an Irish perspective, the likes of Martin Fraser and John Callanan, uh, Brian Murphy, uh, Jim Darcy. Um, and on the British side, you had the likes of Eddie Lister, Mark Sedwell, who was a cabinet secretary at the time, always showed an awareness of Irish issues. But I think that has changed and changed dramatically uh, on the watch of Lord David Frost. And I think that's where a lot of the current difficulties arise. So now let's come to the modern, let's come to today and where I think things are at and the reckonings that were, that are unavoidable. The first reckoning is this debate within the Democratic Unionist Party. Uh, is it a party of traditionalists? Is it a more hardline party? Is it a party that's heading towards the centre and believes in pragmatism? Robinson was a pragmatist. Arlene Foster was a pragmatist. Uh, Edwin Poots has been on the traditional wing of the party. Uh, as I see it, the most important members in the DUP uh, at the moment are Edwin Poots, uh, his nominee for First Minister, Paul Gibbon, uh, the uh, economy minister, Paul Fru, was a very, very difficult position. Uh, it challenges on so many fronts and is going to have to do some very fast learning. And I think of the Westminster MPs, by far the most influential at the moment is Ian Paisley Jr. So I think that debate is going to be had in the DUP. It's a reckoning that can't be avoided. Uh, and I think in many respects, uh, because it has been there for so many years, I take an attitude of, I think, bring it on and let it happen. I think the second reckoning that's going to take place is you look at, say, the numbers uh, in the Northern Ireland Assembly at the moment. The DUP has 28 Assembly members. Sinn Féin has 27. Uh, the DUP lost several members uh, in, the 29, in, the, in the last Assembly elections. Uh, and you've always had this possibility of Sinn Féin becoming the largest party. Uh, and that cannot be avoided. At the very latest, the assembly elections are due in May. Um, if Stormont collapses before then, the British government has the option of allowing elections before then. It can take a number of emergency measures to prevent it for a, a couple of months, uh, for several months. But at the latest, you're going to have assembly elections in, in May. Even before the Arlene Foster um, situation arose, when she was removed, there were some in the DUP wondering, should we go to opposition and try and regroup there? It was only the beginning of a conversation, but they were already thinking, what happens if we are not the largest party? Will we go into government with Sinn Féin? And I think there's a very real possibility that the Good Friday Agreement model of a mandatory coalition that that model uh, is certainly up for review. And you may have some parties who will be pushing for uh, a more traditional model of government and opposition. I've always felt that it was unfair on the Northern Ireland Assembly, that they've had no place to look to, that they could say, well, this is how they do it here and these are the mistakes they make. They've had to find uh, their own chemistry in this situation. They look at Doyle Aaron, it's government and opposition. Okay, coalition governments, single party governments, you have those models, but you don't have this mandatory coalition. They don't have that in Westminster. And if they're looking for examples, it's usually a government and opposition model. And that's a lonely place to be in to be trying to make new history. So I think those important elections are coming as well. The next question I think that we cannot avoid uh, is the question of United Ireland. I think that debate is underway now. 
uh, the question of a border poll. When will it take place? How will it take place? What would be the best circumstances for it to take place? Uh, and I think that Brexit has contributed to that. In some respects, it has destabilised matters, and I think it has accelerated the push for a border poll. And I do believe that train has left the station. I don't know when it's going to reach its destination. It's hard to predict that, but I think it has left the station, and that, that is definitely on the, on the political agenda. I also think it's really important that at a forum like this, we recognise what's happening with Sinn Féin. I look back at that picture of Ian Paisley uh, and his party and Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and Sinn Féin sitting around the table in Stormont before they formed power sharing. And that was a wow moment because it signalled change. When you look at where the DUP has travelled since then and gone backwards in some respects and what has happened to Sinn Féin. I remember it was in 2011, Jerry Adams made the decision to go down south because he was afraid and his party was afraid that they had maybe hit the glass ceiling. They had five TDs at the time. They were afraid they might slip back to four. I think was that Arthur Morgan uh, was not going to stand in Louth. That's where Jerry Adams stood. And you look at what has happened to Sinn Féin since. You look at Sinn Féin at the time of the Good Friday Agreement. The SDLP provided an awful lot of the ideology. Sinn Féin grew to be the largest voice of nationalism stroke republicanism. Sinn Féin is now in that position. Uh, and it's in that position, even though it has seven members in Westminster who do not take their seats, yet they still get a mandate. You look at what has happened down south. Um, you look at opinion polls last week. And I think it's very, very clear uh, that Sinn Féin is fast getting to the situation where it could well be the largest party in Northern Ireland uh, after next May's elections and whatever may follow from those. And it's at the very least uh, on, in line to be a junior partner, at least in a coalition government down south. So that's an extraordinary journey. Now, part of me says that journey has been going on for almost 100 years, that we have the centenary of Northern Ireland. But if you look at the Sinn Féin story, you look at its relationship with Fianna Fáil, you look at Michael Collins, what was his policy when he was a senior figure in the IRA? Uh, his, you know, his links with Fianna Fine Gael. Uh, you look at the row between Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin. You look at the way Sinn Féin has got rid of smaller parties, eaten them up one by one, pushed them aside, pushed its way to the centre. You look at the pressure it's now placing on not just Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. So I think that reckoning is coming south of the border as well. The next reckoning that I think is taking is, is, is inevitable is one on Brexit. What is Boris Johnson going to do in the next few weeks? How are they going to handle the Northern Ireland Protocol? Um, how is David Frost going to behave? What is going to be the role of the Americans um, uh, in terms of how they can impact on the British? What I've seen in recent days is I've seen a British government that's currently under pressure over postponing its opening of society post, uh, post uh, in, the light, in, in the pandemic circumstances. And I see the greatest threat to Boris Johnson at the moment is not coming from Keir Starmer under Labour or indeed from the SNP. The greatest threat to Boris Johnson, I think, in the short, medium and probably long term is from within his own party. Uh, and you can see that he will do things at times to appease his own party. Uh, and I think if Boris Johnson remains under pressure over the pandemic and his policy there, that he's quite likely to consider using the Northern Ireland Protocol to appease some of his own backbenchers. Uh, uh, and the DUP members included. So I think it's coming to a reckoning in relation to Brexit in the, in the next few weeks, because some of these measures uh, have either to be renewed or the British have to go on their own way. Now, there's a part of me that feels that the pressure from the Americans and the willingness of the Europeans, uh, who have been weakened uh, by their uh, vaccine strategy, the willingness of the Europeans to always seek a compromise because of their very nature. The optimist in me says that they will find a way to sort out the difficulties uh, in the Northern Ireland protocol situation that you might bring some element of political stability to Northern Ireland. Uh, but I think that reckoning is coming as well. Just a final point uh, on, I'm following matters over the last 48 hours I noticed Brandon Lewis uh, on his feet today. 
in relation to the uh, Irish language row that's taking place in Stormont. Where do I see that going? Brandon Lewis, in his conversations with Mary Lou Macdonald, it seems, did make some offer that the British government would provide legislation uh, on the Irish language uh, if the DUP were not prepared to do so in, in Stormont. Fascinating that Sinn Féin and the DBSDLP, whose members take their seats in, in Westminster, that they are looking on the possibility of using Westminster to solve a problem that Northern Ireland's Assembly itself is not able to resolve. That these two nationalist parties, United Ireland parties, are looking to Westminster to do that. The irony of that is interesting. My concern, if Brandon Lewis does that, is I think the next obvious move that will come there is you'll have the likes of Nigel Dodds and Sammy Wilson uh, in Westminster, in the House of Lords and in the House of Commons saying, if you are prepared to get involved on Irish language issues that Stormont cannot resolve, well, we are expecting you to do the very same uh, in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I think if you bear in mind that the DUP have votes in Westminster, that they take their seats in Westminster, that they have important alliances in Westminster, uh, I think that could become a factor in British thinking, that if they give the sprat uh, of the Irish language uh, to the SDLP and Sinn Féin, that it would be well within their capacity to give the salmon uh, uh, deeper moves in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol to the DUP and to their own backbenchers. So for those reasons, I think we're in quite a volatile situation. I think we're in a quite an interesting situation. But the final thought uh, I leave with you in this session of our discussions is one of the most profound changes I've noticed in Northern Ireland over the past 10, 15 years is the absence of any sort of grassroots support for the use of violence. Uh, violence uh, plagued our lives for 30, 40 years the utterly unnecessary taking of human life, um, the awful effect that had on thousands upon thousands of people. And I think that explains a lot of the visceral dislike people have of any party who will have any association with the use of force uh, in our politics. And while there have been examples in recent years of street protest, of rioting, uh, and that is not off the table uh, in current times. Nowhere have I seen any convincing evidence to suggest that there would be support for killing and shooting and burning, uh, like we saw uh, throughout the Troubles. Uh, I think there's no public appetite for that. And one of the great advantages of this big brother society we, we live in, of how you can put a little marker into your phone when you're going to meet somebody on your WhatsApp and they can see where you are on the road. I think this whole big brother society we live in where technology has moved to such a place, I think, and it, uh, it brings me great joy to say this, I don't see how even people who would have the intent to carry out a campaign of killing uh, and trying to antagonize their neighbors, I don't think the possibilities to do so exists in our modern society. Thank you.